Ready to go. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, plenary on the topic of water. Uh, this plenary is actually the first of uh, seven water sessions at Davos this year. And I think as you listen to our distinguished speakers and panelists this morning, you're going to get a clearer understanding of the reasons for this emphasis on water. Uh, I suppose that when each of us thinks about water, we probably think about different dimensions or different aspects of water because it is a pretty complicated and, and frankly often vexing issue. But water is actually about more than just droughts in Africa and poor people. Uh, these are issues of great significance to be sure, but water is also fundamental and enormously significant to business operations, to economic growth, and, and really to the quality of life for all of the world's people, whether they're, they're rich or poor. Uh, water is vexing because it, is, uh, it involves multiple users, uh, industrial, agricultural, and uh, domestic and civil society uses, often competing for exactly the same resource not a lot of trust involved in some of those relationships, and that's part of what we hope to address here. Uh, it is a, an issue of enormous global significance, but ironically, it plays out locally in the roughly 260 major river basins that exist on this planet, home to 60% of the world's population. Those river basins cross uh, uh, 145 national boundaries, and so you can see we deal with a a fairly complex issue. It also, water, includes both quantity dimensions, which we think about a lot, but also quality and ecosystem dimensions. So it is a, a complicated issue with many, many facets. I think all of us are mindful that water is a, a vital and an unsubstitutable uh, resource and that it's a fundamental prerequisite to economic and social and environmental well-being of the planet. And yet the attention for many years that's been focused on the looming crisis in water has been worryingly low. Uh, I think that our goal in this panel is to move the needle of awareness and action and to capitalize on some of the recent developments that have focused attention on this, and you'll hear about those from our panelists, uh, to start uh, the process of constructive uh, uh, movement in water uh, forward. Because when we think about the combined effects of, of economic growth and couple that with population growth and urbanization and the fact that a, that a couple of billion poor people are either underserved or unserved uh, with basic water and sanitation, it's pretty easy to see that the storm clouds are already upon us and water stress and in water scarcity. Now, these stress and scarcity issues already affect 20% of the world's population, over a billion people. And the, the impact uh, is likely, according to the UN, to accelerate uh, as a result of climate change. And so we expect that the number of people affected by this water stress may triple in the next few years. So we're hopeful to uh, seek engagement uh, of the group here. And to get us started on this journey, we have a distinguished panel uh, who have been actively engaged in this issue who will share some insights and perspectives. Uh, we have uh, uh, Fred Krupp, uh, President of Environment Defense, uh, Neville Esdell, the Chair and Chief Executive Officer of Coca-Cola Company, uh, uh, Peter Brayback, uh, who's the Chair of Nestle, and Andrew Liveris, who's the uh, chair and CEO of Nestle, uh, 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 Coke, uh, Dow, uh, Dow Chemical, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Do you mind if I trade, uh, trade roles for you for a while? It might be, uh, might be wholesome. But we also have the special honor of having the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, to offer opening remarks on this topic of water. The Secretary General will share his remarks and, and then he'll be seated back in the front row and listen to the panel discussion as much as he can before he has to leave for his next engagement. So, Mr. Secretary General, welcome and thank you very much uh, for joining us.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to uh, participate in this uh, Davos Forum, and particularly on the subject of uh, uh, water. Some of you who have been participating in this uh, Davos Forum may remember that uh, exactly two years ago, I was one of the panelists sitting on this uh, podium in my capacity as one of the candidates for the post of the Secretary General. At that time, I still rem remember that I was very anxious how I should uh, present my case for seeking the post of Secretary General. There was only one person who was feeling uh, relaxed. He was no other person than my predecessor, then Secretary General Kofi Annan. He was uh, really relaxed and he was presenting his case and all other panelists were feeling very much anxious. Now I'm very happy to be back <laughs> as Secretary General. <laughs> Before I say something about water, I need to drink some water now. The challenge of securing safe and plentiful water for all is one of the most daunting challenges faced by the world today. Until only recently, we generally assumed that water trends do not pose much risk to our daily life or business. Largely, water has been taken for granted, while many countries have taken some initiatives to conserve water or wastewater treatment technologies, the notion of water sustainability in a broad sense has not been seriously examined. Our experiences tell us that environmental stress due to lack of water may lead to conflict and it will be greater in poor nations. Ten years ago, even five years ago, Few people paid much attention to the arid region of Western Darfur, Sudan. Not many noticed when fighting broke out between farmers and herders after the rains failed and water became scarce. Today, everyone knows Darfur. What's the problem and where it is? More than 200,000 people have died and several million people have left and fled their homes. Of course, it is a man-made conflict, but there are many factors at work. Almost forgotten is the event that touched off drought, a shortage of life's vital resource, water. We can change the names in this sad story, Somalia, Chad, Israel, the occupied Palestinian territories, Nigeria, Sri Lanka, Haiti, Colombia, Kazakhstan. All are places where shortages of water contribute to poverty. They cause social hardship and impede development. They aggravate tensions in conflict-prone uh, ten regions. Too often, where we need water, we find guns instead. Population growth will make the problem worse. So will climate change. As the global economy grows, so will its thirst. Many more conflicts lie just over the horizon. A recent report by International Alert identified 46 countries, home to 2.7 billion people, where climate change and water-related crises create a high risk of violent conflict. For the 56 countries, representing another 1.2 billion people, are at high risk of political instability. That's more than half of the world. This is not an issue of rich or poor or south or north. In China, the mighty and long Yangtze River no longer reaches the sea. Even developed countries are not exception. 
Water stress affects one-third of the United States and one-fifth of Spain. In the Himalayas, in the Andes, melting glaciers endanger the water supply of hundreds of millions of people in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Chile, and many other countries. In my own country, Korea, when I was young, I used to drink water straight out of the little stream near my house. Today, it's not possible. I'll be in trouble, serious trouble, if I drink water. All regions are experiencing the problem. I saw this for myself, flying over Lake Chad a few months ago. Some 30 million people depend on its waters and river system. Yet over the past 30 years, it has shrunken to one-tenth of its original size, or less, owing to drought, climate change, mismanagement, and overuse. Visiting Brazil this fall, uh, last fall, I had to cancel a trip up a major tributary, tributary of the Amazon River. It had dried up. To the east, over the coming decades, large parts of the rainforest are expected to turn into savanna. I have spent much of my time last year and banging my drum on climate change. Last year, the World Economic Forum made global warming a main theme. Now, you are turning your attention to water, and I welcome this. I must say, though, that this session, whoever might have organized, is oddly titled. This time is running out on water. I would suggest that we can say more simply, water is running out. We need to adapt to this reality. Just as we do to climate change, there is still enough water for all of us, but only so long as we keep it clean, use it more wisely, and share it fairly. This is key to the Millennium Development Goals. They call for cutting in half the proportion of people without access to safe drinking water by 2015. When you consider the health and development challenges facing the poorest of the world's population, diseases like uh, malaria, uh, tuberculosis, rising food prices, environmental degradation, even human rights, the common denominator among these challenges seems to be, again, water. We need to start now to better manage this scarce resource. That is why we will gather world leaders at the United Nations this September uh, for a critical high-level meeting on the Millennium Development Goals, focusing in particular on Africa. We must mobilize world opinion and focus political will. What we did for climate change last year, we want to do for water and development in 2008. Governments must engage and lead, but we also need private enterprises. For too long, business has been seen as a culprit, unfortunately. The smokestacks of industry contaminate our atmosphere, the effluents from power plants spoil our rivers, but this is a misleading picture. More often than not, today, business is becoming part of the solution, not the problem. All of you in this hall are well aware of the dawning era of green economics. Many of you are part of this great revolutionary wave. Innovative and global approaches can make a great difference. Here on this panel, we have Neville Estelle at Coca-Cola. He has been sponsoring local water projects in developing countries. Andrew Leveris at Dow Chemical has been working on innovative ways of getting water to the poor. Peter Brabeck Letmat uh, has made water sustain sustainability one of Nestle's 
core business uh, principles. Last July, in a small group of top international executives came together to launch the UN Global Compact CEO Water Mandate. Their first working session coming up in March will focus on waste, wastewater management and helping people in rural areas gain better access to clean water. And they will have to report back on progress so that the NGOs, citizens groups, and others can learn from their experiences and perhaps join in the effort. I understand the World Economic Forum has about 1,000 members. Only about 20 companies have joined the CEO water mandate. A drop in the bucket, perhaps. But I'd like to think that it is a small wave that will gather force and spread across the globe. That's why it feels good to be here with like-minded people working for the public, global public good. Thank you again, and in the spirit of Davos, I hope we'll have a very constructive and fruitful exchange of views. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General. We appreciate those comments very much, particularly the emphasis on uh, management and, and the important role of the private uh, enterprise as a part of the solution. Uh, so uh, Peter Brabeck, uh, as a business leader who's affected uh, in, in significant ways by this water issue and who's been active in a number of the initiatives, including those, the uh, water mandate uh, that the Secretary General uh, mentioned, uh, I, I'd, I'd appreciate your uh, reactions to the Secretary General's remarks, particularly the role of uh, private enterprise and your perspectives on this water issue. I thank you very much, Ralph. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Secretary General uh, for his excellent presentation of the problem, uh, which uh, I think he has done in an outstanding manner. And I would also like to join him. Uh, we have been the, uh, together, of course, with the UN, the founders of the Sea Water Mandate, with my colleagues here. And we feel also a little bit frustrated that up to now there are only 20 companies that have signed up. And the CO Water Mandate, which is uh, just here, and I mean, you can get it when you're going out there, is just a commitment. And it's a, it's a commitment of your company. It's a commitment also of yourself as the CEO that you are willing to do something to help to overcome the problem of the water. Because the good part of it is we have still time to overcome this problem. Uh, and I will try to talk a little bit about it. But so I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, that you mentioned the UN water mandate, I'm very happy that this um, overall subject of water sustainability has become now uh, a, recognized, a recognized issue at the same level than perhaps some other issues. And also the, 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 the aspect that time, time is still on our side, but time is running out like the water is running out. Um, they are, all of us we have, uh, who are here, we have been doing, we're trying to do our best in order to diminish consumption. Let me just mention that at Nestle we were able to bring down uh, six liter of water per dollar of production that we had down to 1.8. So we, we make a major effort, we publicize this, we make a, a report together with the, with the yearly report. Uh, but I'm, we are not alone. Several of our companies are joining them. But let me talk where, where the real issue is. I mean, the real issue is uh, you have to see water withdrawals, more than 70% is in agriculture. We know that uh, in order to be able to live, we need about five liters of water to drink. We need about minimum 20 liters for basic hygiene. A European consumer, a European citizen, will use about 200 liters of water a day. This includes now your dishwater, it includes your shower, it takes your uh, steam bath or whatever, it takes about 200 liter. But what we don't realize, that the typical European consumer eats every single day about 4,500 to 5,000 liter of water. And that an American consumer eats every day 6,000 liters of water. So when we discuss about water, we have constantly the aspect about water as a human right for drinking. 
And I think we have to get this clear. Yes, we have absolutely full commitment to recognize water as a human right for the drinking need that we have and the minimum, the minimum hygienic need that we have. As a matter of fact, there are good examples, for example, South Africa, which has established that every person has a right to 6,000 liters of water of, uh, of, of per month in a household, and this is free. But to fill up your swimming pool, this is no human right. This should have a price. And I think this is where we sometimes have a certain confusion when we are talking about there is an absolute need that water gets again a price. We are talking about the water that we are using for agriculture, we are talking about the water we are using in the industry, we are talking about the water we are using to fill up our swimming pool and wash our cars. They need to have a price. And I will tell you why. Because just today, our politicians are making some decisions which, if water had a price, would not happen. If you think that we need 9,000 liters of water to produce one liter of biodiesel, then this can only work because water has no price. Okay? Now, if you think now that we are going to use 1,950 cubic kilometer of water for biofuels, when at the same time our fossil water reservoirs are already depleted now, you can see that this strategy that we have today and which is backed by all major governments is not the right strategy. And it is only possible to come back because water has no, has no value. That's a real issue. Now, you can ask yourself, how could you mitigate this? Is there anything that could be done? Well, allow me, and uh, again, taking uh, the UN as a, as, a, as a good example, we still believe that if we would allow market forces to play a role in how to define the value of the water, we could make a big step forward. And I will just talk about one which is coming from a country you wouldn't believe, which is Oman. Oman has a system for 4,500 years. So let's talk about sustainability. That's sustainable. 4,500 years sustainable. Okay? And what you have in Oman, you have 3,000 individual schemes where farmers have the right to access of water. But they pay for this by working on the infrastructure or they pay in money so that the infrastructure is being maintained. And the interesting part of this is that those rights are tradable. So every farmer, they have, a, they have like a stock exchange, they fix a price, and every farmer can afterwards buy more water and less water. The other farmer can sell that off. And the other interesting thing is that from all of this, a certain percentage goes to the mosque in order to supply the poor people with water. Now you have a system which is 4,500 years old, it is tradable, it fixes a fair price, it allows the farmers to sell sometimes part of the right of water, which allows them afterwards to make investment into his farm, or to buy someone, and the needs of the poor are taken care by giving a certain percentage of this to the poor in order to, to assure the same. Now this system has become so well appreciated that the UN now has put it into the World Heritage System. It's now part of the heritage. And it's very interesting to see that it's not because of the, ca the, cha the channels which have been built. It's because of the way that it is being run. So I personally believe that this is a good example, that there is a way to make water, to give water a fair price, to make it trad tradable, and therefore, in order to make a better use of the water resources that we have. So one example, at least, where I think we could be doing something about it. Great points, uh, uh, Peter, about uh, the degree to which we actually uh, eat a lot more water than we, than we drink and, and about the importance of some enlightened form of market signals. I appreciate that. Uh, Andrew, uh, as a leading CEO in a very different uh, sector, 
I, do you share this concern that we ought to be water worried? And uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I really appreciate uh, the comments made by the Secretary General and the leadership of the United Nations. And, you know, maybe I seem like a strange bedfellow up here. And I, I think I, I do need to address the point and the question of what's an industrial company doing here? And why is my company enlightened? And why have we gotten to the 21st century with the notion that business and corporate sustainable, uh, sustainability is one message? They're not two messages, it's one message. All my colleagues at the table here at the podium are at the same point. The challenge of getting more than 20 companies to that point is our challenge. And I take the climate change analog directly to heart and water is today's issue. It is the oil of this century, not a question. How did we get here? Well, back in 95, we established some very tough environmental health and safety goals for ourselves. And amongst them was water reuse. Today, we recycle over 95% of the water we consume, which is a tremendous improvement compared to 1995, where we only did 50%. Just to put it in context, that's 3 million cubic meters a year. If you were standing on the banks of the Mississippi at its outlet down in New Orleans and was watching the water go by, that's the equivalent of five days of water flow. Okay, that's a lot of water. How did we do that? The aha moment we had as an industrial enterprise within our plant fences is we in fact have the technologies, we have the know-how, we have the profit motive, we have the understanding that if we take those and put them beyond our fences and put them in the context of delivery mechanisms, that in fact, whether it's water, affordable energy, affordable food and affordable housing for the bottom of the pyramid, for the three billion people who don't have what you and I have, how do we get them there? What's the goals we should set ourselves for 2015? We were inspired by the United Nations Millennium Goal. We got to work in 2005 and we set some pretty amazing goals for ourselves. We had our aha moment that in fact we have to earn the right to have a footprint on this planet. This planet is fragile and it's vulnerable and Davos is the place where we all get together and integrate our knowledge to provide solutions. Yes, raise awareness, but provide solutions. So how do we play a role? Well, clearly the first point, technology. Technology is here. If the price points are available, we actually have a lot of water on this planet, right? I mean, 15% of Israel's water is supplied by one installation using technology my company's provided. 15% of Israel's water demand, which is arid. Desalination and affordable desalination. Whose challenge should that be? All of ours. Groundwater and water underneath us. The obvious water is sitting on the bedrock. We can access that easily. People do. There's water below the bedrock. How do we get the technologies there? These are very similar challenges to the climate change challenges. So our company set our very aggressive goals to take our technologies out there and work in a systems integration context. That's what got us to the table. A technology provider, but we need to collaborate and innovate. We just love the theme of this year's Davos. And we have, after just one and a half years of effort in this area, have had some surprising aha moments. The NGO community, governments, other enterprises, the United Nations as a congealing force, the call to action and the mandate that was shown here by Peter, those mechanisms exist. In our personal experience base, I'll give you two. Last year we sponsored with an NGO, the Blue Planet Run. I'm not sure how many of you became aware of it, a global marathon to raise awareness, raise awareness. And we raised money. Dow provided a lot of seed money, other companies came along. Today, due to that money, there are 500 villages around the world that have basic water delivery systems. I will never forget the young lady who had her children in Guatemala in a village coming to the launch in the United Nations of the Blue Planet Run Marathon and explaining the difference it had to her life to liberate her and to educate her children so they could be more productive in the context of their village. I challenge every CEO and every leader who doesn't understand the power of water to liberate human rights to go visit villages like that. Water Health International, a company that Dow has sponsored and seeded that has now taken flight as a for-profit. We have 30% equity into it. It basically is working with NGOs in India 
to raise awareness at the village level, working with local governments, and has already installed water systems, very basic systems, which are now being self-financed by entrepreneurs in the village. The seed money from us, clearly, but a very simple thing, putting a loan facility in place that we put our collateral against. We basically give them the credit and give them the time to pay back for the water system. Now that's sustainable. That's not just a gift anymore. That's not just charity. That's business entrepreneurship at the microfinance level. Double HI has the goal that by 2020, 5,000 villages in India will have access to water systems. Tangible actions are required. Corporations have to come to the table. And our company's aha moment wasn't hard to get to. So I would tell you, the technology is there. We need the innovation to get the business model and the delivery systems to the table. And we're very committed to doing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. <coughs> yeah, great points. I think the, uh, it's beginning to underscore the need for these bridges to actually bring these disparate pieces together so that this action can be more forceful. So, uh, Neville, uh, I'd be very interested in your uh, thoughts and observations on this, particularly related to the uh, agricultural dimension uh, Peter mentioned 70% of the ag uh, water is used for agriculture, and uh, perhaps you have some perspectives on that as well as the broader issues we're discussing. So. Okay, thanks, Ralph. It's, it's difficult to follow the two heads of Nestle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and in fact, they have, they have laid out uh, very well uh, the issues, the case, and also some of the, of the solutions. And I guess what I'd like to start with before we actually touch on the agricultural dimension is the whole level of awareness about the water issue. We do have the facts. The solutions are there. The awareness globally and the commitment globally is not there yet. Last year, here in Davos, we were involved Peter was there with me in an off-piste session on water. It was the only session on water in Davos. It was dominated by climate change. Thankfully, this year, we have a plenary, and we have five other public sessions on water. We're getting resonance around it, but it is not enough. I'll add my voice to the signatures on the CEO mandate. This is an issue which ranks next to climate change. There's a nexus between the two. They are, they are really interrelated. And if you think of the hydrological uh, effect of more heat and what that does in terms of evaporation and where that deposits the water and how that brings about change, that, that nexus is very important. However, water has got lost as part of the climate change debate. And I guess part of what we are trying to do today is to raise that, uh, that awareness. And what it does take is it takes collaboration. And, and I think you're all asking, you know, why are three CEOs here very passionately talking about the whole issue of water? Well, firstly, we have to look after our own footprint. We, we have, certainly Nestle and ourselves, we have a footprint and we have a commitment at Coca-Cola that we are going to be absolutely water neutral in the future, to look after our own footprint. But that's not going to be enough. Because unless the communities around the world are sustainable, unless they have adequate water, we won't have businesses. So there's a new clarion cry for business, and that is for engagement in relevant issues for their business and for their shareholders that have a broader global dimension and have a social dimension. And that, I think, is what a 21st century company is all about, and you see three of them represented here today. That level of collaboration means that we do not have all the answers and solutions, and in fact, we cannot have them, and we cannot bring it about. Because there's a triangle here. I talked about a nexus between climate change and water, but that triangle also has food within the triangle. That's the agricultural dimension. 
And Peter has outlined how we, without the right incentives, can actually use food to drive for fuel and how that has an effect back on the equation of water and it also will come back in terms of climate. It is therefore an extremely complex issue. Unfortunately, in today's world, what we look for are simple solutions for complex problems and we don't look at the knock-on effect. So only if we in business collaborate as we do with those very effective NGOs who are doing work around the world, and I'm going to look at some work in Mali when I leave from here that, that we're doing with a specific uh, NGO. Uh, un unless we work with them, we, uh, in fact, our, our work on becoming water neutral is with the WWF, we work with the UNDP, we work with USAID. There's a, there is a new coalition developing which we need to strengthen in order to bring the message out to the world. And unless we get the clarity of the urgency that came around climate change, which was created partly here in Davos and also, of course, uh, by the great work that was done by Al Gore, unless we get that behind us, then we are not going to make the case. We are going to be in the issue because these are transnational issues. Therefore, the conflicts that the Secretary General, who is, is the leading voice behind this water issue, the conflicts that you see in Darfur are going to occur as well. It, it is not a crisis yet, as Peter says, but it's about time that we globally addressed issues before they became a crisis. I see it this way. We need to look after our footprint but also we need to engage particularly with agriculture where 70% of the water is used. Industry used 23 and humanity in general uses 7%. Unless we engage with them because that's our supply chain. When I talk about water neutrality, that's what we use in terms of, of our own manufacture. What Peter's talking about is what we use for people to be able to eat in his case, but also also in both our cases, people to be able to drink. So we're here really in many respects, not to give you all the solutions, but to point out the solutions, but to make a real plea and a plea to the forum that we raise the issue of water to the level that we have managed to raise the issue of climate change. Thank you. Yeah, good comments uh, about the sense of urgency and about the opportunities that are there, because I think it's, all of you are pointing out that, that there are opportunities for efficiency, and, uh, and the key to that is, is collaboration. Excellent points. So Fred, as, uh, as a leading uh, non-governmental organization, highly respected, what are we missing so far in the, in the dialogue, and, and uh, what are your ideas about how this collaboration and and uh, perhaps these market forces might be harnessed. Do you even agree with that theory? Maybe you don't. Well, thanks, Ralph. And uh, I think uh, your comments, the Secretary General's, uh, Andrew, Peter, and Neville, uh, have been very insightful. And I agree with uh, virtually everything that's been said, uh, especially the sense that the current situation needs to be understood as unacceptable. This is a matter of human rights that everyone should have access to clean water. Imagine that 2,000 years ago in Rome, the citizens of Rome had access to clean water and sanitation services then that half the residents of the planet today still don't have. This is unacceptable, as Michael Spector pointed out in his seminal article in the New Yorker back in October of 2006. If you haven't seen that, I would urge it upon you. Beyond the fact that there are these uh, human needs, though, um, which are very important and have to be met with a sense of urgency and can be met, I especially appreciate the perspective that these problems are very solvable, which makes it unacceptable and solvable means it's inexcusable not to, for all of us to collaborate to take the actions necessary.
But beyond that, uh, the need to serve human beings is also the need to serve the ecosystems. I don't need to look further than my own country in the United States to see a tragic a ripping apart of the fabric of life because we've taken water, way too much water, out of the rivers. We go to the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, the average flow of a river in the Sierra Nevadas now is about five or six percent its natural flow. If we go to the Colorado River, which used to support um, over a million acres of magnificent wetlands in Mexico, the United States manages to uh, deliver, at most times, no water to Mexico. The riverbed is dry, and those wetlands are desiccated and in need of being restored. They can still be restored, but they need water to do it. Yes, the United States uh, is experiencing, beginning to experience its own water problems, not to the same degree as Latin America, Asia, and Africa. But in the southeast United States, we've had a severe drought, uh, beginnings of real water shortages and the need for conservation. The reservoirs of the mighty Colorado are now half full. Um, even the Great Lakes, home of 20% of the world's fresh water, uh, are now sh uh, showing effects. Lake Superior is down at last count about two and a half feet. So we all need to learn how to use water more efficiently. And, um, and to do that, for the sake of the ecosystem, we have to recognize that there need to be limits. So we have to put caps on the amount of water that can be withdrawn. And it's amazing what happens when you do. San Antonio faced a cap on the withdrawal of the groundwater from the Ogallala Aquifer and they figured out how to use water, 30% less water per household uh, through an aggressive conservation measure. In California, 40 years ago, there wasn't a vineyard that used drip irrigation. Uh, today, 70% of the vineyards deliver just enough drips of water directly to the roots so that tremendous amounts aren't wasted in evaporation. These things are possible and these things are solvable. And I agree with the point here first raised uh, by Peter that we need a market price. Absolutely, we cannot hold poor people hostage to a market price. They need to get water for free. And they need easy access. But for industrial users and massive residential consumers for swimming pools and the like, we need a market price that will get tremendous efficiency and will be a key to solving this problem. There have been examples, many examples around the world, um, of water trades that have resulted in money flowing from municipalities or industries to farmers so that farmers can have the money to install drip irrigation, the big trade between the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and the Imperial Irrigation District being perhaps the largest of these. But these are possible when you let water be traded, and this is what we need to facilitate around the world. In addition, to, though, to the fact that um, we need to serve human beings and we need to serve the ecosystem by putting caps on the withdrawal of water and protect ecosystem values at the same time, and both of those things are solvable. Don't let anybody tell you we can only solve for one. We can solve for both. The third thing we need to do, and um, I was uh, very pleased, Neville, to hear you bringing it up, is we need to solve for climate too. Because climate, as I think you said to me yesterday, Ralph, is going to be a great accelerator of water shortages. And unless we put caps on the amount of, of global warming pollution we throw into the atmosphere, and we, unless we put limits on that at much lower levels than today's levels, we are walking into a hell for water shortages. So we need to solve climate, too, and it is interrelated, as Neville pointed out. So those are the thoughts I would add, Ralph. Good. Uh, thank you. I, I particularly appreciate the notion that these problems are solvable. I think all of us on the stage here agree that, that they are. The issue is really synchronizing all the forces in a constructive way. 
We're running a bit short on time, but I wanted to uh, uh, allow the audience to uh, ask a few questions. Uh, I see uh, Mrs. Uh, Kawaguchi uh, from Japan, so we're happy to have you here, ma'am. So. Thank you for the uh, great uh, speech by uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and also comments from the panelists. I could not agree with all of the things that have been said. Yes, networking, partnership is very important in solving water issues. Um, since there was no public voice raised in, the, in this panel, I thought I would venture to uh, talk about what the public sector does. Um, Millennium Development Goals is very important. I think we should be all committed to achieving this uh, while it costs so much money. Uh, also, uh, we, in order to do this, for instance, Japanese government is the largest donor in water uh, internationally. Uh, we spend about $4.9 billion uh, in assisting uh, in the past five years we, we did. In doing so, we stress certain points. One is that uh, human security issue. The other one is uh, sustainability of water use. The third is um, fostering human capital. Fourth is the um, using the uh, appropriate technology. And uh, number five is this um, the synergy in um, so that multi sector are benefiting from the water assistance. Now, um, there have been a discussion of climate change and water, and I agree with that. But I just would like to point out and would like to get your views um, on one thing, one point which where the analogy ceases to cease. And that is, and I am saying this just to highlight that water solution is more difficult perhaps than climate change. Uh, water solution is has to be local. Uh, if I uh, stop using shower every day in Tokyo, that does not increase water supply in Beijing. Now, um, water has history, regional history. In order, in order to solve frictions in Mekong River uh, area, well, there is Mekong Commission, and we, Japan, um, assists very much in this endeavor. But um, that solution, whatever that is, when achieved, is not going to apply to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So local solutions are needed, and that's going to make it more difficult to solve water issue. Um, as the, um, since I am a diet member now, I, our commitment, Japanese government, Jap Japanese public sector's commitment is there to solve water issues and we have been doing as much as we could, and we will continue to do that. But uh, there is a difference in water and climate change. Thank you. <clears throat> Panelists, uh, comments on this, the local global aspect uh, that, that uh, Mrs. Kawaguchi has mentioned? Well, I'd just like to say we, we probably were remiss in leaving our governments alone. Peter did make the point of the very good example of uh, South Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly, uh, governments are a absolutely vital part of this partnership and uh, they're the ones who are going to enact uh, the, the, pr the pricing. I think our concern is that unless we raise the issue as being a holistic issue that we are going to get uh, simple solutions, simple solutions which, which actually complicate uh, the issue and I think the, uh, the, the whole uh, Data, all the data points that Peter gave around ethanol would be a very good, a very good case in point. But clearly governments are, are part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrew and I actually just came from an earlier session when we were talking about uh, how we do address the, the issue, and that is we do have to do it on a regional basis, actually on a water basin by water basin basis, mm -hmm. and to create good working examples, not just in the developing world, but in the developed world. There's a, I think globally, there's this misperception that this is a developing world problem and it's only has salience in the developed world like the southeast of the United States where there's, there's an existing problem but uh, broadly in the US it's not, not seen as an, an issue. So um, the solutions are not going to be really global solutions but local ones which then can be used as examples to be taken globally and I think that's a very good point that you make. 
-hmm. And just to add, uh, in the session we had this morning, in the call to action, we have to address at a local level how we inventory, how we get data to the table on use, efficiency, quality, and that work has to come from somewhere. Just like climate change. Climate change at the 30,000 foot level is right. Now let's get the data by sector, by country, who can contribute what. That's a data assembly that we are all putting into the call to action yes. that actually has to be funded by public-private partnerships. Yeah. Good points. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Well, I think that if 70% of the water is being used by agriculture, then one of the key questions is, how to foster more R&D, put more commercial economics on cropping patterns which are more optimum fostering in terms of water use. And how does it really build a kind of a synergy between commercial economics and agricultural practices? My question is directed to the CEO of Nestle. Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, one clarification. Um, Agriculture withdraws 70% from the water, uses more than 90% of the water. Because as you had heard before, industry is withdrawing about 20%, but in the case of Tau Chemical, is reusing the water, and therefore the usage of the water is 90% in agriculture, so it's even worse. Now, you're absolutely right. I think when we are talking about agriculture, we have to think about technology. We wouldn't be able today to really uh, give nutrition to the world if we hadn't had the Green Revolution. And I think we have to be extremely uh, thankful uh, to mm. Nobel Prize winner Bolak, who was the father of the Green Revolution. But we need another revolution in agriculture today, and we have, we have the technology available. Now, that this technology is not being used everywhere in the world has to do more with politics than with anything else. And this is basically the gene technology, biotechnology which exists and which in many parts of the world is not being used just because of political aspects. So there is a solution to that. But let me just come back to what was said before. I share with you that the solution to the water is more complex than the solution to the climate change. But there's even think something more. I believe there are three things that will be vital for the survival of things. First thing is nutrition. You know, we can do everything, but if we don't have food to survive, we will not survive. The second one is energy. We cannot live in this world anymore without sufficient energy. And the third one is our environment. Where we are making a big mistake today, that we are trying to solve one problem, which is the energy problem, by making the other one, which is a nutrition problem, even worse. And this is where I think it is absolutely wrong to make all those political decisions on one aspect, which is CO2, and we are creating today enormous problem on the other area, which is the agricultural uses, the water uses, and things. This is where we make the biggest mistake. And we have not yet talked about something which I'm sure is going to be in the headlines in the future. We have not talked how much water we are needing, we are needing in order to produce oil. It's 2.5 liter of water for one liter of oil today. Okay? We have not talked about this. So the more oil we are needing, we have a multiple of that water. And if we are going now to exploit the heavy oils and the oil sands, this need for water in the oil production is going to be multiplied by 10 and 100. Because in order to exploit the oil sands, we have to inject steam. And this is only water. Mm -hmm. So this aspect, which comes additionally, trying to solve a problem with this energy, which is a problem, but trying it by using the most scarcest raw material and the most precious one of the world, which is water, I think we are making big, big long-term mistakes. Yeah, that's uh, especially important to keep in mind that there isn't a substitute for water at the end of the day either, and so we have to, uh, we have substitutes have, to for oil. have to find new mechanisms to look at this more holistically. I couldn't agree more. Fred? Rob, I just wanted to uh, add to the Peter's point that the, the real irony 
is that while conventional ethanol is being put forward as a solution to the energy problem and the CO2 problem, it's not. It, at best, it's a marginal benefit, and for what? So it, if biofuels are going to play a role, it's got to be a completely different generation of biofuels, and uh, it is not even a, a solution to CO2. Good point. I've just been told we've been granted a few extra minutes so that we can have a little bit broader audience participation. Are there other questions from the audience? Just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. So. Yes, over here. Good morning. Thanks very much for the wonderful session this morning. I have a quick uh, comment. Since it's becoming pretty difficult to get CEOs to sign the water mandate, Maybe it should become a grassroots operation, and perhaps we should go to the web and have millions of us sign up. And maybe that will be enough of an incentive for CEOs to suddenly realize that there is money to be made if all of us can sign up and eyeballs and advertising and so on. I was wondering if you might want to comment on that. Thank you. Well, that certainly ought to create a little pressure. I think all of us have signed the CEO mandate, so uh, we're open to any creative ideas, and we appreciate the comment. Any, any other uh, uh, questions from the audience. It's kind of, uh, I have a question for the. I'm sorry, did, I missed you. Yes, right here, sir. Hi, Ricardo Hausman, Center for International Development at Harvard University. Um, let me let me take you a little bit to task on on this uh, consensus against biofuels that's in in the in the panel. Um, uh, lady uh, spoke before said that. Uh, water is a local issue. And the question is, how much land is there in the world that could be planted, rain-fed, in areas that are not currently under production? And if you look around the world, there's tons of land in Africa and in South America that are not currently under production that could be rain-fed and produce biofuels, maybe the next generation or something. So I support the idea that water should be priced and then the market would allocate the biofuels to the area where the price of water is low. So I would not want to scratch off the table the idea that biofuels and economic development in Africa and South America can be part of the solution uh, to global warming and to a better use of our water resources. That's a great comment, Ricardo. And I think the thrust of the, uh, the comments here is not expressly anti-biofuel, but rather uh, the concern that these political decisions are taken in isolation without the regard to the near-term consequence. And perhaps one of the uh, responses ought to be to step up the rate at which technology is developed so that these uh, inherent uh, marginal yields for CO2 or impacts on water will be addressed. And I'm sure they will in the fullest of time. Andrew, you're a technology buff. You well, can comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, Fred was a technology buff. He basically <laughs> said it, which is this generation. Uh, we're at the primitive stage of biofuels. And so I think he qualified his comment with ethanol. And I think, Ralph, you said it very well. We need to point our resources at the next generation to increase yields, to lower. The, and everything Peter said about oil, very true. Uh, so we've got to direct. This is an integration issue. One begets the other. And I think that's the point being made by the panel. Yeah, this uh, gives me a chance to say that next month I've got a book called Earth, the sequel coming out on all sorts of uh, answers to climate change. And there's two chapters on biofuels. So cellulosic ethanol, and har harvesting native grasses and making it more economical to digest the cellulose and turn that into sugars. Uh, if we can get the incentives right, that could um, be an answer. But right now, the political decisions are to dictate one type of biofuel, which isn't a good answer. And it's not based on a CO2 metric. There's got to be accountability in environmental rules, because otherwise people use environmental needs as an excuse to line the pockets of a few. We need to have a system based on a carbon dioxide metric that the more you reduced, the more profitable that technology is. And that's why a carbon cap and trade system makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Looks like we're moving in that direction. I saw, I don't know if Fernand Koshla is in the room, but I talked to him yesterday about his cellulosic ethanol 
fairly big money being spent to try to advance that technology, which has the real promise of both better water efficiency but also a better net CO2 yield. But it is uh, something that we're not, uh, we're not there yet, but I, I, I'm hopeful that we'll get there. I think that the key, as I, as I try to think about the, uh, the aggregate of these discussions, I mean, clearly what you're hearing here and what I think the, the sentiments correctly are is that we have a very dangerous situation w with, uh, with, our, with our water future. Uh, many elements are already unacceptable, bankrupt, as, as Fred had mentioned, and, and many others are uh, in imminent danger. Uh, we're, we're going to begin to affect <laughs> our capacity for economic growth. We're going to have to make these decisions in a broader and more enlightened way. And so we do desperately need these avenues and mechanisms for greater collaboration. Uh, I, I would like to just ask the panel one last uh, 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 question, if you would, about this uh, collaboration. Because we've talked about the importance of market forces in an enlightened way. We've talked about the need for some new financing mechanisms. Those are beginning to take shape and would be reinforced. Uh, we talked about efficiency of use and stewardship, which of course would be driven by enlightened uh, market forces. Uh, Andrew's talked about the importance of technology and how we have to advance that. But uh, we do have this natty issue of the collaboration and how do we give effect to that? What are, what are the means to do that? Because right now, we have a zero-sum game afoot. We have ag interest and industrial interest and municipal interest often competing for the same resource in a zero-sum game uh, that, that is uh, often inures to the detriment of the ecosystems and, 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 uh, uh, and the like. So I would appreciate the panel comments about what one or two things we might consider as important means to advance this notion of collaboration, because I'd like to take that forward into the subsequent sessions uh, on water that will be held here, where we're going to be trying to come up not just with rhetoric, but with some actionable items. Well, let me say, maybe we're not properly representative sitting up here on this stage. We really should have had one of the NGOs that we all work with uh, up here to actually represent the other side of that equation. Mm -hmm. I think each one of us can give examples. We've got 120 water projects around the world mm -hmm. where we work with, with various NGOs. And we are learning from that process. I talked about the commitment we've made. We're, we're working on that with an NGO. Mm -hmm. And they're learning from us. But what we've got to do is we've got to scale that up. Mm -hmm. the, 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 it, we, it is a drop in the bucket. That was something the Secretary General said, what we're mm -hmm. doing. We've got to scale that up. That's why we need to broaden it. That, you know, the challenge on, the, on the mm -hmm. signing the CEO water mandate is not to sign a piece of paper, is to be involved in these collaborative efforts. So I, I think the core of the collaboration is there. The scale is not having the yeah. right effect yet. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's basically what all of us have done on the stage, singular solutions within our domain. We have found each other. We have been brought together. We have a mandate. Uh, whether it's web-based or not, we need support <clears throat> to make this a collaborative effort. We'll bring our NGOs, our friends to the table, governments that are interested. The United Nations is definitely there. We need to get a systems integration model like climate change. Mm -hmm. And I guess, never at the end of the day, we'll drive to do that. Yeah. And of course, that has been the purpose of this panel, is to make us aware of this sense of significant urgency the opportunity, and hopefully to fill us with a little bit of hope that this is a solvable problem. This is. Time is running out, but this is an imminently solvable problem. I would invite all of you to, uh, uh, to consider attending the uh, Securing a Watertight Future. That's a public session on water. It's where we're going to try to draw out and broaden this base of commitment uh, to help us effect the solution. Nine o'clock Saturday, it's here in the Congress Center. And we hope as many of you as possible will participate in that because this will be your chance to actually get engaged and to uh, sign, sign up, uh, create the blog. You can do that through the welcome system here at the forum. And all of these things, I think, are, are important because what we need desperately is to engage all of your creative energies in these subsequent sessions to identify actionable items on these new partnerships and the new collaborations and the kind of policy framework that we ought to be uh, considering that are more holistic, the basin strategies that need to come into effect to really address this global important issue that plays out in, in, in the local contest. 
context because this is a problem that can be solved and there is still time if we act with conviction. But time is running out and so there is a sense of urgency. You know, as I was looking uh, around these beautiful mountains here at the Davos setting, I was thinking about the passing of Sir Edmund Hillary uh, 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 recently and he said, it is not the mountain uh, we conquer but ourselves. So in the case of water, perhaps we can paraphrase Sir Edmund Hillary and say, it is not the water that we must conquer but ourselves. And with your help, we'll get it done. Thank you all very much for your attention.